So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our first two speakers. Uh, Chuck Nicholson is an associate professor at UW-Madison, whose position is funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. His research specialties include dairy markets and policy, food systems modeling, controlled environment agriculture, and linkages between agriculture and food security. And then right after that, we'll hear from Luis Peña Lovano, who is an assistant professor in agricultural economics here at UW-River Falls, whose position is also funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub. So right off the bat here this morning, you get to hear from two faculty that would not be here in Wisconsin if not for funding from the Dairy Innovation Hub. Uh, Luisa's research focuses on economics, finance, international trade, and will leverage new and established connections with the agribusiness community in Wisconsin and the surrounding areas. He started here in August of 2021. Chuck and Luis are going to talk about their work on a special project about the cost of dairy production in Wisconsin. Please welcome them. Okay. Great. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. So I'm in case you're wondering, I'm Chuck Nicholson, that's uh, Luis Peña. Uh, so uh, this project uh, gives me great pleasure because I can talk about a collaboration between River Falls, Platteville, Madison, all three campuses involved in the Dairy Invasion Hub, and also an informal collaboration with our good friend Leonard Polzine with UW Extension, recently hired to do dairy markets and policy. Uh, this project began as a result of a conversation that Heather White, who you just saw, had with a dairy farmer who said, why is it that the numbers I see for cost of production don't really seem to match up with the things that I experience in my real life? And so this has morphed into an idea of exploring this in a little bit more detail to understand the basic patterns, communicate in both directions with a dairy farm audience, and then see if we can come up with some things that would be useful in terms of dairy farm management. So one of the things that we started out with also was a knowledge that there's a great deal of diversity. And this is actually data from our colleague Kevin Bernhardt at Platteville with five years showing there from the Ag Financial System AGFA that provides farm record information. And this is actually the spread in those data of cost of production on 148 Wisconsin dairy farms. So Maybe you're looking at the scale there, that's dollars per hundredweight, and there's a massively bigly huge range of uh, cost of production on dairy farms, uh, going all the way from uh, under $12 to nearly $30, right? So that in and of itself is really kind of interesting, even though there's a bunch of blobs there in the middle, let's say the averages are maybe a little bit less extreme than that, but there's something going on there, right? And you may say, well, Chuck, okay, some of that's organic farms, uh, some of that may be due to some other things like farm size. Well, we can also look at averages for farm size, and we still see some patterns that show some differences. And this is a little bit more complicated because Kevin broke out the data into kind of the lowest return on asset farms, the red line, uh, the third uh, segment, the third tercel of uh, farms that are in the return on asset category, and then the highest is the green one there. But even if you look at a farm with 15 to 99 cows, there's actually a still a pretty big spread in the averages there. And there's also some interesting things going on with regard to getting bigger farm sizes, okay? So we have some intriguing information to begin working with. One other thing Kevin did to start us out in this project was to think about the impact that cost of production and the farm milk price that a dairy farmer is receiving has on their overall profitability. So here we're actually looking at a profitability impact measured in dollars. And basically the red bars are talking about the impact that price has on the profitability of those farms. The green part of the bar is looking at the cost of production impact. The left hand side there is talking about farms that were in that top third of return on assets on profitability. The other side here is that the farms that were in that bottom third of return on assets. In either of those cases, the size of the bar is telling us something about how important that factor is, the cost of production and the price, both of which are pretty important here. Uh, and actually, particularly for the larger farms, that cost of production becomes a really important number based on the data we have for thinking about how profitable the farms are. Okay? 
So this was kind of a starting point for thinking about what we want to do. It's also some work in progress that we will update. But we know that cost of production and price are key drivers of dairy profitability. The large range I showed you raises some questions like, hey, what causes that to happen in the first place? Are the same farms always kind of in the same category, or is it one year you're lucky and one year you're not? Do we understand anything about the basic patterns over something like that five years I showed you? What's the relevant, relative importance of cost of production versus factors like price, which can be influenced obviously by things like the components in the milk? And ultimately, we ask a question that is more directed to what can we do about this, which is can we identify some management strategies that seem consistently to be better uh, for different sizes of farms in different locations that will improve uh, the cost of production. Okay? So this project is going to start with kind of going back to the original conversation that Heather had to have some listening sessions with farm groups, and that's going to be farmers as well as agricultural finance folks, the bankers. And then we're going to evaluate in a little bit more detail sources of information on uh, cost of production. AGFA is the one that's been historic, but Luis is going to tell you in a moment about the use of implan. USDA also publishes some information on a, about like a five-year basis. We're going to look at that. And we want to document the different cost of production patterns here in Wisconsin, again, by size, production system, and to the extent we can by region. So part of our goal is to identify the importance that price and cost of production have to profitability. We also have, and I'll tell you more about this in a second, an objective of supporting continued record collection processes through this new program, Farm Bench, so that we have the data. I really liked, uh, I guess it was Dave who was talking about, we need data to be able to make decisions. Same thing is true when we're thinking about farm profitability issues. And then we'll have some concluding uh, educational webinars and podcasts. So I'm going to turn it over to Luis to talk about his part of this. Thank you, Chuck. So as Chuck was mentioning, one of the databases that I'm going to use is, <laughs> thank you, that is the disadvantage of being smaller. <laughs> so as Chuck mentioned, one of the databases that we are using in this project is Implant. Implant um, is a database that compounds different multiple um, enterprises, and it's able to disaggregate the data in different county levels. So because one of the reasons why we are doing this project is to understand what are the sources of variation for the case of uh, cost of production, we decided to use implant as a different source. Um, one thing that I want to point out is that in the case of implant, they uh, provide this data depending on the states. So we were able to purchase the, specifically the data for Wisconsin from the past 20 years. That will allow us to see, for example, one of the variations, it, it is depending on the price, it is depending on the labor uh, cost, and all the other different um, input materials that change over the years. The reason why we're doing this is because in, in that way, we are going to have a reference point when we want to collect the, uh, the data from the farmer. Because once we know where the farmer is coming from, we can also compare it to the values obtained by implant. Particularly in this case, we are collecting specifically for the dairy production and also their intermediate products and intermediate uses. And for our case, we are counting right now um, with the support of one of our students, Owen Sarkeski, which is also in, in, in the audience, who is actually in charge of collecting the database uh, for, our, for our project. Now, in, in this regard, our main objective of using it is to assess a broader uh, uh, understanding of the economic ranges, specifically, as I mentioned, the case of the changes in prices, cost of production, labor uses, and the data actually is implemented up to 2021. We are actually going to get that uh, at the end of this year. So we will have actually um, a very novel uh, database that at the same time will um, include the most recent changes, especially due to the pandemic, and how that has been affecting the dairy industry. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Elise. Appreciate that. So I'll move that back up. So one of the things I mentioned was we have a new program that's been developed that would allow for the collection and dissemination of farm financial data. Farm Bench was uh, developed with a collaboration across many different parts of UW and Extension. 
Uh, this is something we want to actually make a focal point for encouraging folks to enter their information so we have a broader base of information to work for. And this is actually something that should be a, a good platform for us for the next decade or so. So we're having listening sessions this December. Uh, the initial data analysis, as Luis mentioned, is underway. Our key uh, extension of this is to update the information that we have for 2014 to 19 to actually cover the last three years, 2019 to 2021, that we have data available for. Those were kind of interesting years, as most of you would uh, imagine. Uh, we'll be cleaning up the farm bench data for those years. And we have scheduled already some educational podcasts and webinars for April and May of 2023 as we complete the data analysis that we are doing. Okay. So the ultimate idea is to make a contribution to decision making on farms and to have a two way communication with the farm and ag financial community here in the state uh, and to continue that important source of information that we need to monitor and analyze the cost of production that we have on, on Wisconsin dairy farms. So I'll stop with that. I don't know if we have any time left for questions or we're moving on, but that's what we got. And the microphone comes back down. <laughs> All right, any pressing questions? Okay, we will have collective questions at the end of each block, so we'll come back to that. Thank you. Don't, don't get too comfortable out there. We may need you to come back up here. Okay. All right, so uh, thank you to them. Great, so next I'd like to introduce Chris Holtkamp, who is an assistant professor in conservation and environmental planning here at UW-River Falls and whose expertise and focus is on rural communities. As a planner, he takes uh, the unique challenges and opportunities facing small towns and helps them leverage their limited resources for maximum benefit. Please welcome Chris, thank you. All right, so um, I'm a geographer, so I care a lot about place and identity, and I'm an urban planner, so I care a lot about community. And the chancellor this morning spoke to the importance of dairy to Wisconsin, the identity of Wisconsin, and we put it on our license plates. This is America's dairy land, to the importance of the local economy, right? The state's economy has largely been driven by agriculture. It's transitioning now to other things, but agriculture still remains an important part of the, the economy of our rural communities. And as y'all certainly are familiar with, um, that industry is changing. It's in transition. We're seeing a decline in the overall number of farms, even as we're seeing increased production and the increase in the total number of cows and cattle, I guess cows are female cattle, right? I'm, I'm not a dairy person, so bear with me on a little bit of this. But farms are getting bigger and we're seeing fewer farms. So my interest is what impact is that having on our rural communities and what impact is that having on the farmers themselves? The characteristics of the relationships and networks that, that farmers have amongst each other. And so that was my question. What effect is this transition in dairy farming having on the rural communities um, across Wisconsin? <coughs> and so the research when I started digging into this really showed that as we see increasing farm size and we start to lose those smaller family farms, we tend to see a decrease in a negative effect and a decrease in social capital and economic conditions across the state. So farms are getting bigger, but it's actually, uh, in some instances, negatively impacting those communities around those farms. So um, counties with those, oh, I guess I could stand, no, well. No, if you wanna walk, walk. Can I, yeah. can y'all hear me okay? Okay, there we go. All right, so counties with large farms tend to have lower social capital, they tend to have worse economic conditions. And so if that's what's happening to Wisconsin, we want to start to think about how do we counteract that? How can we identify policies and practices that will address those challenges and maybe strengthen those rural communities? So um, how many of y'all are familiar with social capital or have heard that term before? I see a few hands going up. So social capital is really about the networks, relationships, norms of behavior um, amongst individuals and across communities. So when the, the question I asked the panel earlier, that idea of like how much do relationships matter in terms of farmers adopting better practices, right? A lot of that comes from, oh, my neighbor is doing this thing. It's working on his farm. It's a good thing. I trust my neighbor. I'm going to adopt those same practices. 
So when we see a decline in social capital, we lose those networks, we lose those relationships that can have a really positive impact on farmer behavior, you know, activities, those kinds of things. And we also tend to see um, lower economic conditions as well. Oftentimes with large farms, with these bigger corporate farms, they're not necessarily getting their feed from a local producer. They've got a, you know, their corporate relationships with larger producers, they're getting their feed from somewhere else. They may have a corporate veterinarian, they're not using the local vet. So we, we tend to see uh, weaker economic connections between larger farms and uh, the local communities as well. So that was kind of driving my research, but there wasn't a lot that actually was related specifically to Wisconsin. So that's where my research came in. And so what I did was I took the top 10 dairy producing counties in Wisconsin, and I measured the social capital, measured the economic conditions, and uh, looked at changes in dairy farm size and number of farms across those 10 counties to see if there was a relationship there. So to measure um, social capital, I used an index that was created by the U.S. Senate in 2018, the Social Capital Index. It has a county-by-county county, um, metric for social capital uh, for every county in the United States using widely accepted proxies for social capital, things like um, membership in organizations and clubs, uh, voter participation, census responses. The, so measuring social capital, as you can imagine, is a little tricky because it's things like trust and relationships, and those are hard to measure. But using proxies like membership in social organizations, volunteerism, voting activity, you can get a pretty good idea of how connected people are to their community. And then for the economic conditions, I used um, a metric called ALICE, which is developed by the United Way. It's called the uh, Asset Limited Income constrained employed. And so what that is, is it's a metric that looks at economic health of individuals or households, but it's a more complete picture of economic health than just like poverty level, because it looks at things like uh, rent and cost of groceries, cost of gas, all of those expenses that make up your household budget. That's what goes into uh, creating that Alice metric, and it's at the county level. So I have county data for social capital, I have county data for economic data, and they're both created in 2018, so they match together. And then the 2017 USDA census gave me the change in farm size, number of farms between 2012 and 2017, so I had that kind of similar time periods with my different data sources to see what I came up with. And the results were kind of meh. It was kind of disappointing, and I had this like, great idea, I'm gonna see this cool relationship, and I really didn't. Um, the one county that kind of stuck out was Brown County. It had um, the highest percentage of large farms. It was about 18.5% of the total farms in Brown County were over 500 head, so it had the, the most large farms. It had the lowest social capital, as you can see. Do I have a pointer on this thing? Yep, maybe. I don't know. You can see it over there on the left-hand column, the second one down. It had the lowest social capital by far of all the counties that I looked at and compared to the state as well. It had the second highest percentage below that Alice threshold, so income constrained households. And it had, again, the highest percentage of large farms. Other than that, the data was kind of inconclusive. There wasn't really a strong relationship between increase in large farms and a decline or a, a difference in social capital and economic conditions. So a little bit disappointing, but what this does is it creates a baseline. So. Um, what I have really is a snapshot of conditions in 2017. As y'all know, in 2018, that was when all the headlines across Wisconsin were, you know, 10% of dairy farms shut down over 2018, 800 plus farms, you know, closed over that same time period. So by, by having this data set focused on that sort of 2017, 2018 timeframe, I have that baseline data. So now with, with additional research, I've done a survey now that I'm, I'm analyzing, looking at, um, I can start to see what's changed in the five years um, as we've seen that um, decline in, in dairy farming really accelerate over that time period. So it's a really nice foundation to build on for future research, even though the results I, weren't quite what I was hoping for with this study. It does create an opportunity um, to do some comparison analysis and time analysis to look at what's happened since uh, this research was conducted. And as I said, um, Brown County being that kind of outlier that did have a clear relationship between large farm size, there may be an element that there's a threshold, that once you reach a certain percentage or a certain number of large farms at the county level, 
maybe that's where you start to see those negative impacts really start to, to occur. So if we're seeing that consolidation happening, maybe that's where we get to the point of, okay, now we're seeing this happen. We're seeing you know, the percentage of large farms increase at the county level. Now we need to start thinking about those interventions to maintain social capital and economic health in those rural communities. And I just talked really fast. So, um, oh, so I actually, when I did this presentation, I did it for students to kind of show them what a research presentation looked like. And so um, I set up a future research because the idea was to show the students, like, this is what you can do. If you're having conclusive results, it's not a failure. You can actually set yourself up for future research. So I, I want to do this same study again in 2022 when the, or when the 2022 census data comes out, the ag census data, to see what's happened in the last five years and how conditions changed. Um, doing that direct measurement of social capital, so again, that survey that we conducted over the summer provides that kind of direct measurement of social capital. And then that idea of a threshold, again, looking at is there a percentage of large farms where we start to see those negative effects start to happen. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Any pressing questions before we jump to the, I think I might have double mic going here. There we go. Yeah. Don't go far, Chris. I'm not gonna be able to answer this. Okay. <laughs> um, looking at your research, have you done any research into processing plants, say meatpacking plants or cheese factories or something like that That's also in those counties? That's a good question. I have not. Um, I think we've seen consolidation certainly in the processing side of things as well. So I think you would, might see similar results in terms of consolidation and the effect on, on economic conditions. But my research specifically didn't look into that. Go ahead, Doc. Uh, is there a way, are you accounting for proximity to urban areas and potential off-farm job opportunities? Is there a way to account for that? The, the survey has that in there, so once I start really diving deep into the survey analysis, we'll look at you know, if there is that relationship between off-farm um, employment and social capital. But certainly when you look at urban versus rural counties, there typically is higher social capital in the rural counties. And if you look at the data, you can actually see that like Kewanee County, which is one of the smallest counties in, my, in the top 10, had the highest social capital of any of the counties. So certainly there is an urban-rural divide for sure. Go ahead. You use the term inconclusive results, but could the results really be conclusive that there's not as much difference as you would expect between large yeah. and small? You know, could you actually have some true results here that aren't either not affecting some of the social capital as much as you expect? Yeah. Yeah, and so one of the things we're doing with the survey is-, is Chris, direct, can you repeat the question real quick? That way the people online can hear. Oh, me. sure. Yeah. So in, instead of the, the results being inconclusive, maybe the reality is that there's not that much of a difference between large and small farms in terms of social capital and economic conditions. And that's, we're gonna look at that with the survey because we, we have you know, the data of like farms over 500 versus farms under 100 head is the kind of the divine point I used in terms of large versus small. So we can actually look at that direct comparison of large farms and small farms to determine is there a difference just based on farm size, not at the county level like what this, this analysis was. Great. All right. Thank you for the questions. We'll move on. And again, we'll have some time at the end for questions across to all these speakers uh, and some discussion. So thank you, Chris. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Bob Zhang, who is an assistant professor of agricultural engineering technology at UW River Falls. He's a licensed professional engineer with expertise in the areas of machinery systems modeling, testing, automation, and numerical simulation. Uh, I don't know how many of you, obviously several of you are from here, but if you're not from this campus, we did a walking tour yesterday and there'll be some opportunities for tours later. But there are some great labs in this area uh, over in the building. So if you get a chance, I encourage you to uh, go on some of those tours. Um, Bob's gonna talk to us today about his ideas for manure application through vertical tillage systems. So please welcome Bob. Oh, just testing. 
Uh, good to have an in-person event like this, but as you can hear my voice, don't talk too much, don't socialize too much. That's the result. <laughs> All right, hope you can hear me. Hopefully, that's the... So a little bit background information about my project here. So as we all know, liquid manure is a very good source of organic nutrients for your crop, for your soil. So and then their carefully uh, managed uh, manure application is very important to apply those nutrients into your soil without compromising the environment. So that's the idea here. And then all, all know that the surface spreading is very low cost, is very practiced uh, widely, but there's some obvious some, uh, drawback of that application. So we all want to have the injection in cooperation going on for the uh, manure application. But the recent survey uh, in Wisconsin showed that only a quarter of manure being applied is immediately incorporated, is injected into the soil, only a quarter in Wisconsin. So that's the, um, that's the background information about this project. And then another concept in this project is vertical tillage, which is a relatively new-ish uh, type of tillage uh, system, which has lots of features, less soil disturbance, very low in draft, uh, draft force, very uh, low in energy consumption, and lots of uh, soil conservation uh, features of vertical tillage. So my goal here is try to marry those two, try to have uh, investigate the feasibility of incorporating the uh, vertical tillage and the manure application system into one um, organic system. And then hopefully at the end, we'll be able to evaluate those aspects, the economic, economic and environmental aspects of this uh, new concept or this new system. So right now this project is on the uh, preliminary study phase which including the prototype um, design and evaluation, mostly in the uh, virtual world, which is simulation. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, the uh, depends on funding availability, we would have the uh, ability to work with some colleagues from plant uh, earth sciences, uh, work on some uh, field testing and field trials with, um, with the design we come up um, in this uh, pre, uh, preliminary design uh, stage. All right, so to start, this off, uh, to sta start off this project properly, I want to have as many inputs as possible from the stakeholders. So my students and I uh, actually visited and uh, called uh, more than a dozen uh, dairy farms and customer applicators in this, not in this area, both uh, western and eastern Wisconsin. So the message we got is typically they will use the disc in the spring, have the reaper in the fall. So that's the very common practices nowadays. And then they would prefer to have injection as compared to incorporation. And that's obviously depends on the field condition, depends on the availability of your equipment, of your, of your um, labor or help available at farm. And then there's some issues with the injection system. So those are uh, those, those, uh, few message we got very constantly from the uh, survey is, number one, the manure injected manure, especially with the vapor system, going to run down the hill and then have a pounding at the bottom of your hill and that's very bad for soil conservation. And then the manure is not going to apply evenly, not going to have a uniform distribution along your, uh, in your field. And then another one is the nutrient leaching and um, groundwater contamination, especially in uh, drill, um, especially in uh, uh, drain uh, tilled uh, fields. So that's another big problem. And last but not least, we to prevent any overflowing and any uh, surface uh, explosion of your manure, for the shallow injection, it's very hard to have a right application rate. So what I mean, uh, right application rate is typically we want to try to aim at 20K or even higher than that. But typically with the shallow injection at about two to three inches steps, the most, what I heard is 10,000 gallon per acre or a bit higher than that, but that's in that range. So that's not enough for them to get rid of all the nutrient, or to apply all the nutrient into the field. Uh, so that's the message we got from the stakeholders. So with that in mind, we come up with a list of design criteria. So I'm an engineer by trade, so we like to have a list of design criteria to start, any, start off any project. So list of uh, things, and I'm not going to list all of them here, but the important ones is we want to try to achieve an application um, depth of two to six inches, and then to have an even horizontal distribution. So those are the two very important ones. And to have a very uniform manure soil mixing zone within that two to six 
inch soil profile, and then to minimize the uh, surface explosion and the um, uh, in your fail, and then some of the soil conservation uh, practices to have the least amount of soil disturbance, to have the maximum uh, radio coverage at the end of the application, and then to have the least amount of uh, drought force that's in terms of the uh, fuel economic for the application. So with those uh, design criteria in mind, my students and I come up with three design concept for, uh, um, for now. So I don't know how much time I have. Maybe I'll come back to the uh, discussion of the well, I better keep going. So with those uh, design concept here, well, probably it's one topic, uh, one more point on the design tool. So for that, it's very basic. I uh, have a vertical tillage um, uh, blade in front. I have those uh, very aggressive discs following that. And then what happened here is you have those discs opening up a furrow at about two to six inches depth. And then there's a hose, but behind that, just injecting that following the uh, disc and there'll be some uh, sweep, small sweep following the injection to try to have the incorporation underneath the injection. So that's the concept. We do not have the incorporation before we have the incorporation underneath your soil surface. So that's the concept of that. So keep that in mind. And then the whole concept here is we want to have as many simulation as possible before we actually build this thing, we actually do the field test. So one of the concepts uh, utilized here is the called uh, Discrete element method, which is an emerging and a very popular simulation software or simulation method used in machinery system modeling and, uh, and simulation. So with that, what I did is, well, one question we have for that desire is, what, what will be the, what will be the uh, need of a shield of the adjacent uh, blade to prevent the disturbed soil get into the furrow before we inject in the manure? So do we need a shield? What's the distance? What's the geometry? What's the size? So many questions about that. So to answer those questions, we come up with a model, and it's carefully uh, calibrated and validated. That spent lots of time on that. And then we had four different angles. And uh, you can see on the image here, the smaller the angle you have, the further you're going to display the soil to the side. So with that, we actually measured what will be the soil disturbance at a certain distance away from the disc, anywhere from 14 to 22 inches. And then this image is showing you that what's the soil disturbance on those shield. And then also we monitor the soil force experience at different angle showing on the table. So some of the information we got from this practice is the largest angle, 30 ticket tier angle, would, you, would give you the lowest drop force, which is good. And then another benefit of that is with this maximum angle, you can see on the right column here, if you place that shield at about 18 inches distance away from the disc, you actually don't need any shield at all. There's not much so disturbance happening at that distance. So you do not need a shield if you're able to put that shield or put the disc 18 inch away from the adjacent uh, disc. So that's some of the uh, uh, message we got from the simulation, and then this uh, project is still in progress, lots of uh, simulation going on. So as I mentioned, we try to have the, uh, the uh, design uh, finished by the end of this uh, year, and then have some uh, future uh, prototype uh, uh, fab fabrication, and also some uh, field trials uh, for, this, uh, for this project. All right, I will open to question if there are any. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. So if all the speakers can come back up now, that way uh, whoever the questions are for, our online audience can hear and see you uh, as well. And with that, I'd open it up to any questions, discussion, thoughts on this first set of speakers or priority areas. And if Maria, if there are any online, if you could read those out, please. There's not a break we're rushing to, so we need questions regardless. Is this on? Okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Holtkamp. Um, I work for a nutrition company, and I'm based about an hour north of here. Uh, so just want to start with an anecdotal background. Um, in my area, there's a lot of uh, migration from rural, sorry, urban to rural areas, and that has seemed to shift social capital 
immensely to the point that it's impacting farmers in the region. So to what degree can you account for that in your surveys? And how much of a role do you think that plays in how social capital and dairy farming might interact moving forward? So um, the survey I did, I, I sent, uh, we did a survey of dairy farmers specifically, um, and then we did a survey of the community. And so um, similar, some similar questions were asked trying to, to measure social capital and, and um, and economic conditions across the two surveys, but obviously one was geared more to the farmers, one was geared more to the communities. Um, we didn't specifically ask about longevity in the community to know of, of, of when people moved in or out, but I think we could certainly look at um, the survey results and then compare that to population change over the last few years and to start to see where we're, we're maybe seeing a connection between population growth and social capital declines. Um, I will say in my dissertation research, I actually noticed that in uh, the suburbs of Atlanta, where you have that really significant suburban growth in those counties, you see even though the, the economic conditions are really high and you see strong economic um, vitality, the social capital is much lower. And a lot of that is, is attributed to the growth and the change and people don't have those longstanding relationships. So that's certainly something with the survey I can look at for future research. Right now, I don't have that data. That's a Thank long you. way to say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes, right? Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife says I talk loud, so. Here. Yeah, but the, on, the <laughs> online audience, I don't know if you're loud enough to reach all over Wisconsin. They could even <laughs> check that out. <laughs> Just talk. So a quick question, in regards to the sampling that you did and the, uh, the research that you did, did soil type seem to matter or make a difference in regards to your studies? That's for the manual application. But we're not that stage yet. Right now we're focused on the uh, design stage. Eventually we will have the design prototype uh, built. We're going to look at different soil types, hopefully incorporate that into the, um, into the study. Yes, but that will be a good uh, factor to consider down the road. Uh, question for Chris. Uh, with your data, you used a county by county mm -hmm. type of uh, data there. And we've heard that uh, we look at radius from the farm on purchases. Was that part of the data set or was it just basically within the county? It, it was at the county level simply because that's what data is available. It's easier to get economic data certainly at the county level and because I had for this particular presentation those indices at the county level that just made sense to use the existing data. I have a question for Chuck and Luis. If someone's listening in here today or online today or later and wants to participate in the listening sessions where would they find out the details of that and how would they reach out to join those? Uh, thanks a lot for that. So we are in the process of organizing those now. Uh, they can email me directly or basically Luis or Kevin Bernhardt if they're feeling more comfortable talking to folks at River Falls or Platteville. Uh, we're hoping to have that kind of early in December and do it on, online so relatively convenient. Great. And if you need their emails, everything can be found on our website or social media. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, well, let, oh, we have five minutes left. So if there are more questions or discussion, please don't be shy. I thought we were tracking one down. Jory's on a hunt. All right. Well, with that, uh, oh, Steve's got one now. So to Chuck and Luis, I, so, any, so if someone wants to participate in the farm bench, I, the, the data recording, I, one, how do they do that? And do you have any suggestions in terms of how to entice individuals to participate in collecting this very important data? <laughs> yeah, really, really good question. So 
Typically, the information that went into AGFA and then also the, uh, we have for the first three years uh, under the Farm Bench program have come through uh, financial institutions or the associations that farmers participate in. So generally speaking, it's not like the retail service where you go and put in your own information in there. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is figure out how we can make that more accessible so that you don't have to be affiliated in that way to enter, uh, enter the information. Really good point about uh, encouraging folks to participate. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is provide some feedback that says, here's why this would be useful in general. I've also proposed that we provide individual benchmarking reports to farms if they don't already get that, that would compare farms in their region, their size category, their focal points. Uh, and so they can actually look at how they compare for better or for worse uh, in terms of the various financial metrics. I have also proposed, but have not gotten a lot of traction, that we would actually uh, develop a sort of a long-term panel where we would pay people to be in it every year so we would have sort of the same farms so we could track them over five to ten years. Uh, so I'm still working on convincing folks that that idea might work, um, but I think that's actually kind of where we need to go if we're going to have that benchmarking for the financial well-being of farms in the state going over a period of time. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. We have uh, one question online for, for Bob. Um, we have a listener that is wondering, is there peer-reviewed literature supporting that manure injection is enhancing groundwater nitrate levels? That's a good question. So what I found from the literature review is depends on the method you inject the manure into the soil. On average, if you do that right, that's going to enhance the groundwater contamination, I mean, prevent the contamination if you do that right, as compared to the surface spreading and incorporation. However, as emphasized, if you do that right, so that's the whole point of this project. We want to find the right way to do that and to make that a true statement, regardless the soil type, regardless the field condition, regardless the manure you're applying to it. So that's the ultimate goal of this project to have a sort of the universal system which would work for, ideally, for every situation. But that might not be true, but that's, we'll find out. We'll have to see what that um, entails at the end. Okay, thank you. Turn it back over to Heather. Great, all right. So with that, let's thank this round of speakers. All right, so uh, as we roll into our next block of uh, priority areas here, we've got projects in the human health and nutrition and animal health and welfare priorities. Uh, again, we'll have time for questions at the end, just as we did. Uh, and our first speaker of this block is Grace Lewis. Grace is an assistant professor in animal and food science at UW-River Falls and uh, is one of our other uh, hub-funded faculty in our early cohorts. Her research interests include high-pressure technologies, dairy food byproducts, processing interventions to improve dairy protein functionality and nanoparticles, emulsions, and foams. Please welcome Grace Lewis. Thank you, Heather. Um, so I was told I can't walk too much, which is really hard for me. Um, so here I am. Um, my name, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so Chris said he talked fast. Buckle up. I will try not to talk too fast, but milk is cool, right? We all know that. So my project, op optimization of casein micelle nanoparticle formation using high pressure homogenization and processing, processing aids. What the heck does that mean? Let me tell you. So. I always break into a table of contents and somebody's like, you have 10 minutes, why are you doing this? I need this, all right? So this is for me mostly, but also to help you follow along. I'm gonna talk about an introduction of what is AKC and myself first. Then I'll dive into some results. I had a student working on this project all summer, um, so she did an excellent job, so I'm gonna talk about some of the initial results. And then conclusions and next steps. So let's jump right in. All right, so if you're looking at milk, Coming, of course, it varies based on you know, what cow you get it from, a variety of other things, lactation stage, et cetera. But in general, it's about 87% water, about 5% lactose, about 4.5% fat, about 3.5% protein, and a small amount of vitamins and minerals. My students are probably cringing because I tell them to memorize that, all right? But we're looking here at this protein segment. 
So of the proteins in milk, you have two major groups, if you will. About 80% of those proteins are casein proteins. These things, these casein proteins organize into, a, or rather they're not very organized, but they orient themselves into a spherical shape. And we'll talk a lot more about this casein protein. And then we have about 20% of milk proteins that are whey proteins. We're not going to talk too much about whey proteins today. Um, that's another project I'm working on. But we're going to focus on these casein proteins, all right? So this is another way to look at the casein protein. Uh, so the casein protein is oriented into this micelle structure, this spherical structure. There are four major casein proteins, beta and alpha S1, alpha S2 caseins are located in the core of the sphere. And on the surface are these kappa casein proteins, which are little hairy extrusions, if you will. So this guy, you cannot see my pointer at all, but this guy is about 200 nanometers in diameter, right? It's large enough that it scatters light. If you look at skim milk, it appears to be white because casein micelles are scattering light, all right? So part of the reason why milk is white is because of the casein micelle. The other reason is fat, but we're talking about the casein micelle for now, okay? So the spherical protein structure. So this guy is a delivery system for amino acids, calcium, et cetera, to the neonate for, for baby cows, right? It, it's a delivery system. But the system can be optimized using technologies we have today. One of the technologies that I use a lot in my lab is high pressure homogenization. So this is the exact high pressure homogenizer I have in my lab, where the sample goes up here, about 100 milliliters. Then it, the sample is forced through a very, very small nozzle. You can see kind of a little schematic of the nozzle up here. The nozzle I have in this machine is about 0.13 millimeters, so very, very small. So imagine you're forcing milk through this very, very small nozzle. The sample then enters a heat exchanger to cool it down. You can apply some back pressure, and then you collect your high pressure homogenized sample out. All right? So because of this small nozzle, you can achieve pressures of up to 300 megapascals. Typical homogenization occurs at about 15 to 20 megapascals. This is about, this is a lot times that, right? This is a much, much, much higher pressure. It's about three times the deepest part of the ocean. Very, very, very high pressures. This system's very customizable, so you can change the orientation, you can adjust the pressure, you can add, um, you can cool it, you can do a bunch of stuff with this system, okay? However, what I'm doing with this system, again, here's the title, is to take your casein micelle, again, the spherical protein structure, and using high pressure homogenization, break it into its component parts. In addition to high pressure homogenization, we add ethanol to help with this process, as well as we heat it up, all right? So we're looking to see how we can optimize this process using high pressure homogenization, ethanol, and heating. Then you can evaporate ethanol off and release pressure to re-aggregate these proteins. Well, why, why would you care to do that? So again, when we disassemble this protein, we can actually add a variety of other compounds in Think about vitamin D, think about medicines, drugs, colorants, etc. And we can then reassemble this protein when we evaporate the ethanol off to encapsulate these various things. Why would we want to encapsulate these things? Well, let's talk about vitamin D. Vitamin D is very sensitive to light. If it's encapsulated, it's protected from external stimuli like light, heat, etc. It also makes its way through the gastrointestinal tract more favorably. So it's not digested in unideal places. It makes it way, its way through the gastrointestinal tract more favorably for digestion. Okay, many applications for this. Animal feed, so fish also need vitamin D. They don't digest it very well. Can we encapsulate that in this protein to help with that? Pharmaceuticals, nutrient fortified food products, and many, many more. Okay, so the design here, again, kind of running through this slide, but we're using a range of ethanol concentrations, a range of high pressure homogenization conditions, and a range of temperatures to try to optimize this process. To see that we're optimizing the process, we're looking at the absorbance or the turbidity of the sample, because again, if you break down the casein micelle, it's a clear solution, which we'll see in a couple of slides. We also are looking at the protein hydrophobicity, the particle size, again, looking if we're breaking down those proteins, as well as the microstructure. Then, where we haven't studied quite yet, is evaporating ethanol off to see how the protein re-aggregates and looking at similar things in the re-aggregated re structure. Okay? Hopefully that's clear. So, some results. I love pictures. So we're going to look at pictures. I think it tells the story pretty clearly. 
But these are samples that have not been high pressure homogenized. On the left picture, you're looking at the samples at five degrees Celsius, roughly refrigeration temperature, from zero to 60% ethanol as you move across those tubes. On the right side, you're looking at the same ethanol concentrations, but now at elevated temperatures. You can see on the right side, you have some of those samples that are clear, right? We're breaking down some of the casein micelles. Now, as we apply pressure, similar images, but if you look on the far right, you, can have a, you have a sample that's very, very clear. What is this telling us? This is telling that, us that in the initial sample, we have these casein micelles, they're scattering light. By the way, these are 20% skim milk samples. I should have said that to start, but they're 20% skim milk samples. So initially, we have these spherical casein micelles, they're scattering light. However, with the application of ethanol, heat, and high pressure homogenization, we're really breaking these things down. This is what we want, because then the idea is to re-aggregate these proteins so we can encapsulate different things. All right, another way to look at this is simply to look at sample absorbance. This is more quantitative, if you will. So on the x-axis of these graphs, you're looking at ethanol concentration. On the y-axis, you're looking at absorbance at 400 nanometers, so roughly what you are seeing. So when you look at the sample, this is what you're seeing. On the left side, you have no high pressure homogenization. On the right side, you have 300 megapascals at different temperatures. As you watch, or as you go from left to right, you see that the samples are becoming clear, which we saw in the images. This is why I like images, because it, I told that story a lot faster, right? But here's some quantitative data, and we had some intermediate temperatures here as well. So, very quick cover all the results that my student worked on. We have wonderful students here at UWRF. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of them at the end, but she did a great job, just some of the initial results. Now diving into the next steps. So of course the conclusion here, at elevated temperatures, 60% ethanol is effective at dissociating these casein micelles. High pressure homogenization helped with this process, so we have completed this initial step here. Next step is to re-aggregate these things. So again, to re-aggregate, we evaporate the ethanol off, we form these, these protein aggregates again, and to do this, I have a rotating evaporator in my lab. So you have your sample shown in blue there, you hold it at a constant temperature, and you evaporate just the ethanol out, leaving the skim milk and the water behind. And after that, measuring the particle size and the microstructure of these samples. I told you I had cute pictures. Look how cute they are. They're great students. So Kate Peterson um, was the one who worked on this project all summer. She did an amazing job. This project was funded by the Dairy Innovation Hub, and I have pictures of my other students down in the left side because they're all, I really, they're cute pictures, right? So yeah, that's that. I will take any questions now or at the end. All right, let's, let's thank. I messed that up. It's all right, we can go back. Let's thank Grace. All right, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's Scott Rankin. Scott is a professor and chair in the food science department at UW-Madison. He also currently serves on the as the chairperson for the Madison Steering Committee for the Dairy Innovation Hub and has been integ integrally involved in the hub's execution at Madison. His research is focused on the characterization of uh, primarily dairy food flavor with sensory and instrumental techniques. Thank you and welcome, Scott. All right, uh, thanks, Heather, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just by way of background, I primarily, um, so my main appointment is with, is, with, is with Extension, and I support dairy foods processing. So I did courses in milk pasteurization and chemistry and cleaning and sanitation and a bunch of courses in frozen desserts and so forth. My research program really focuses on the characterization and sort of manipulation of small molecules. So uh, Grace was talking about large molecules, proteins, and things like that. My uh, attention span only allows me to really focus on smaller molecules, and that's the subject of my work today. So uh, title then, uh, Converting Acid Away to Glucose, Galactose, Syrup, and Milk, Milk Minerals, and the Dairy Innovation Hub has helped fund what we kind of refer to as reduction to practice uh, uh, research. So, there, so we can do studies and, and so forth and generate papers, which, which we have done, but uh, the Dairy Innovation Hub funding has helped us sort of bridge the gap between this neat idea and something that may uh, end up in our, our processing um, industry soon. <clears throat> so uh, 
I'm going to give you a pretty broad overview of work that's been going on for a few years. Um, I have some really kind of complex slides, and I'm just going to you know, burn through them pretty quickly. And, uh, but you'll have the content. I think the slides are all available to the speakers here. All right, there have been an array of funding sources. Uh, you know, we're, we have some tech, tech transfer issues uh, uh, in process as well. Uh, it really began by looking at Greek acid way. That's kind of the focus of this work and the, what I'll talk about. But it's, ex it's expanded to other subjects so, um, that involve lactose. There are some key publications. I have this clever little flame there. And, and uh, when, when, re just a week or two ago, we were, we were selected by a, a publication for the Royal Academy of Chemistry and as they, they selected it. extremely well received and has been selected by our editors as a hot green chemistry article. So, <laughs> I don't know what that means. But <laughs> and uh, again, Dairy de de Innovation Hub funding is uh, helping us along here. So. We'll come back to this, but this is essentially kind of an overview of what this looks like. So we make Greek acid, we make Greek yogurt, and we generate Greek acid whey, and we have a particular role in which we insert this technology. Okay, so that's just a brief overview of what that looks like. So Greek yogurt, so if you go to the supermarket and you go to get yogurt, well, you know, back when I was a kid, we had, I don't know, strawberry, vanilla, you know, blueberry, but now there are a bunch of different flavors, and there are a bunch of different types now, right? And so Greek so we discovered Greek yogurt maybe 15, 20 years ago, and now it's over half the market in the U.S. is Greek, Greek yogurt, and that's great uh, for, if you're Greek. I don't know if you, if, you like that, if you like that kind of character of yogurt, and, but it generates some waste streams that are a challenge to, ma to manage, so that's what I'll talk on today. So Greek acid whey looks, so there's a picture of it there on your left, and, uh, but it's because of its character, its, its processors are pressed to what do we do with it. And so that's been a challenge for the processing industry because of its acid character and a few other uh, attributes of it. It's this slide details some, you know, it's a big, it has a big footprint in for processors. And we, we work with some processors that would make more product, not if they had market, not if they could find the milk, but if we could get rid of the waste. So this is where we're kind of, kind of targeting. And so I guess have you think a little bit about what we're doing here, and really what we're targeting is a, a small molecule, I mean, that's kind of my area, and it's a small molecule of lactose. That's what we're focused on. And I've talked with the, you know, the, 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 those on the production side of our, of our of formula in of, uh, uh, academia about can we get cows to stop making lactose? You know? And the answer is kind of no, I guess. Is that right? Not a, I don't know, but uh, it's a challenge to, do, to, to approach it from a, from a production side, from the farm side, because of lactose's role, biology and lactation and so forth. However, so with that in mind, well, now what do we do with lactose? And you know, we, we value the components of milk for, for many reasons. You know, if you're, if you're an athlete and you're weightlifting, you know, dairy and you know, whey proteins we, we heard of, uh, casein proteins are super valuable proteins. You know, the holidays are coming up and you know, milk, or milk fat prices. So another component of milk is uh, you know, milk fat and we love good butter for the holidays and for a lot of and price of butter is, is really you know, going high again and so that's, all, that's great. Um, and, uh, but lactose, you know, you don't hear about lactose much. You don't, like, come home from work, oh, I had a hard day, honey, where is the lactose, you know? We don't really have that kind of a view of lactose, and it's, it's, so its market value is not really that attractive, and it's from a molecule standpoint, it's very difficult to know what to do with it and how to process it because of its, of its attributes. Anyway, this slide just gives some details of that. Greek acid whey is mostly water, so because so we talked to the engineers around water is very difficult to get rid of, very expensive because of its properties to get rid of water from dairy systems. So there's lots of water, lots of lactose. It's not a sweet sugar, and we have people that not just they don't just you know they, they're intolerant to it, right? And so they have so they avoid dairy because of that, and that's a you know growing a perception and problem that we contend with, and it has lots of acid in it. So Greek acid whey is an acid whey stream, so it's very low pH, and that presents another challenge to deal with. A lot of different you know, approaches to dealing with Greek acid whey. Here's just a, a, a common list, or, or a, a, you know, a general list of uh, areas that they've looked at that really have not panned out that well. It's a challenging product to deal with. So a colleague of mine across the road, in, uh, still on campus, across University Avenue is uh, you know, George Huber, and he's a catalyst expert. And uh, we got to talking just you know, socially you know, on, on one occasion, and I, we sort of stumbled on this subject. You know, what can we do? How can we apply catalysts 
to food. And we just don't do that. You know, we apply enzymes, we ferment things, we do you know, ultra high pressure, all these different things, but we never really apply catalysts. So, so, uh, so when, you, when you're done here, go out to your car, look under your car, you'll see a catalyst, you'll see a catalytic converter, and it's transforming in a continuous fashion you know, toxic, relatively toxic you know, uh, molecules from the combustion engine into relatively less toxic molecules as they leave the catalytic converter. So that's what we're doing, but not with fumes from a combustion engine, but rather Greek acid way. So again, that's the target here. And so that's kind of the challenge, is to generate some technology around using a catalyst to convert Greek acid way. Now there are enzymes to, to hydrolyze lactose, and those are great. Um, but they take time. And uh, so one of our parameters is we make lactose-free ice cream, we incubate uh, ice cream mix for four to six hours at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, that's a challenging, that's to get the enzyme to do its thing. And from a food safety standpoint, everyone's worried about that kind of a operation as such. Catalyst, we make that same conversion in really a matter of minutes. So these are so the design is to make continuous flow catalytic converters that we partner with the dairy processing to get rid of lactose. We convert it into glucose and galactose. It's monomers. <clears throat> so um, so it's a dairy-based sweetener. Okay, it's so, so lactose is not a particularly sweet sugar. You convert it into glucose and galactose, and voila, it is. Um, we reduce the lactose food footprint, so now, you know, milk, ice cream, cheese, Greek acid yogurt, and managing Greek acid yogurt, we can make those products without the footprint of lactose. Um, we can reduce sweetener, and uh, ice cream has a lot of sugar in it. And uh, I teach, and we teach five courses in ice cream making, and I make this statement, and no one's challenged me yet, but I make this point that I, frozen desserts behave as if they're a 25% sucrose solution. And if we look at it, the chemistry of it, that's right. That's a lot of sugar. Like Pepsi is like you know eight, nine percent. Ice cream has a lot of sugar in it, and part of that big footprint of that sugar is lactose, because you have to enrich the milk to make ice cream mix. The make legal ice cream mix has a lot of lactose in it. So if we take the lactose out, add back glucose and galactose, we'll have to add less. Um, uh, I know, Elizabeth broke my train of thought there. With the, you got two minutes signed, but but uh, we have to add less sucrose back, and there are chemical and reasons why we would do this. So we actually make ice cream just as sweet, just the same texture with less carbohydrate in it, which has some nutritional advantages as well. So. These are what these reactors look like. They're quite small at this stage. We're building a larger one with the Zero Innovation Hub support. Uh, here, we've done a lot of work on this, and these are now publications. If you Google like Rankin and Lactose and Whey, you'll find the publications that we've generated. Here are some of our scale-up operations in terms of what, what this looks like. On you know, we have, we're just finishing up our dairy plant as well, and so these are some views of what that what that looks like. So, so the idea is that we make glucose galactose syrup. Um, kind of all these, you know. Uh, and we met with that fact uh, FDA just earlier this week, and they're you know F FDA. We have a team of FDA people and uh, who approve food additives, right? And we're trying to get grass status for this. And you know, FDA can be hard to read sometimes. And uh, but they were very you know encouraging. You know, we, they kind of look at this like they look at corn syrup, <clears throat> which uses a similar process to yield high fructose corn syrup or or caro syrup. You know, uh, and so it's looked at a very similar fashion. So the idea is we can take these lactose rich streams from dairy processing and convert them into a sweetener. And catalysts um, come in various you know, permutations on the theme. And we, oh, this is some economic analysis and stuff like that. So you can look at that. But another target, so we can take the catalyst and use it to make other things. And one other thing is tagatose, which is a non-nutritive sweetener. You know, they have long, there's a kind of a short list of non-nutritive sweeteners. It's grass status. And it sells for $50 per kilogram, and it's very difficult to get. However, with a catalyst, we can make it, and we're working on those, that project as well. So then just another view of, you know, kind of lowly lactose. Um, and uh, uh, so stop, is that, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we can take it and convert it into something that has a significant value. So I'll, I'll guess I'm ending there, right, Elizabeth? All right, thanks so much for your time. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, nothing like hearing all of that food chemistry and then asking the definition of the word stop, right? So 
All right, as we move on, I'm sure there's a lot of pressing questions for Scott and the other speakers. We'll grab those at the end. So uh, as we move on, we want to mix it up here a little bit. So our next speaker is a graduate student, Kaylee Reesgraf, who is pursuing her master's degree in dairy science at UW-Madison. Her graduate assistantship is collaboratively funded and mentored uh, by faculty at both UW-River Falls and UW-Madison. So this was a special initiative uh, that we did as a part of graduate training funding from the Dairy Innovation Hub, where we are intentionally funding projects that have co-mentors at two campuses and funding uh, coming jointly from those two campuses. And the undergraduate student pursuing the graduate degree is from either Madison, or sorry, either from Platteville or River Falls, respectively. So Kaylee is one of those first. Um, she grew up on her family farm, a and uh, Lee Slow Acres, sorry, uh, near Fond du Lac, and received a bachelor's degree, as I mentioned, here from UW-River Falls. Please welcome Kaylee. Thank you, Dr. White, for that introduction, and I was so excited to share this with all you that I could not sleep last night, so here we go. Where does my... Nope. Nope. All right. So my master's research has focused on heifer feed efficiency and how early life stressors impacts that later on in life. So first of all, heifer rearing is expensive. And any of you that have raised heifers before, I'm sure you know that. Um, I was just talking to a farmer in Madison last week, and he was telling me that he would pay a grower $2.50 a day to raise one heifer. So it's pretty expensive, and there's a lot that go into it. So the goal overall is to decrease costs while maintaining or improve productivity of our animals. So one question that we raised was, what impacts heifer feed efficiency early on in life, and how can we relate that to heifer methane emissions as well. So I'm gonna tell you about how I measured methane emissions and I used a green feed machine by Sealock uh, Incorporated. And the green feed machine measures, measures methane, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen emissions. It's a voluntary process so the animal can go up whenever she wants and she's encouraged to visit by a sweet little drop of pellets um, that goes right in the, in the front here. And the Green feed machine can sense when the animal comes up and it dispenses the pellets and then it turns on a fan that draws in everything that the animal is breathing out. So that's how we get those gas flux emissions. You can use a green feed machine in either pasture, uh, tie stall, or free stall operations. Um, for my project, we use it in free stall operations. So it looks just like on the bottom picture there, there's a gate to limit competitions. We only have one animal going up at a time and it just sits in the back of the freestall pen. So in this first project that I did, um, heifers were either pair housed or individually housed from birth to weaning. And then I adopted them onto my project at 18 to 20 months of age. A little bit of background on uh, pair housing. Um, there's a lot of research talking about social benefits and cognitive benefits that animals that are paired with a buddy um, are just used to a little bit more uncertainty, right? They don't know when the buddy's going to get up or when they're going to start talking to them. So they can deal with a little bit more stress um, because they were raised in that kind of situation. Um, there's also improved public perception around pair or group housing calves. The University of Minnesota did a survey at the Minnesota State Fair and about two thirds of adults said that they agreed with pair housing and even more, over 70% really agree with group housing animals as well. And the table is from Dr. Jennifer Van Oss, which just so shows you that pair house animals uh, improve or perform better or equally as well as individually housed counterparts as far as uh, dry matter intake, average daily gain, and birth weight. And there are no studies that show um, that pair housed animals uh, perform worse than individually housed animals in those areas. So our hypothesis was that isolation stress due to individual housing would impact heifer growth, heifer feed efficiency, and methane emissions in the long run. So this is what I found. Um, pair house animals uh, 
ate more, dry matter intake in kilograms, depending on the week compared to individually housed animals. And that difference is sometimes almost one kilogram or 2.2 pounds, so I think that's pretty significant. However, the average daily gain was the same, so I did not see a significant trend there. And now you're saying, okay, well, if they're eating more but they're not gaining more, where is it going? <laughs> I think it's because the, when the animals came onto my study, the pair house animals tended to weigh more. So while they weren't gaining more in a rate, they came on already or already weighing more, so they were eating more. It kind of makes sense to me. All right, and then for methane emission results, I did not find any statistically significant differences between um, methane production or carbon dioxide production, but what I think is exciting is the visit data that I have here. So the green feed keeps track of how many times animals are coming up to the green feed machine. And this is exciting because of the social and cognitive development that you see in para group house calves. So I saw a tendency for pair house calves to be visiting the green feed machine more than the individually housed ones. So they're willing to approach that novel object that we just dropped in the back of their pen. Then the second project that I did, I was looking at the effects of in utero heat stress on later life heifer feed efficiency. And there is a lot of research surrounding in utero heat stress. Um, Dr. Jimena Laporta's lab has done extensive research on this. And we know that there are negative effects on the cow that is experiencing the heat stress. But we also ha have to think about the calf that is in utero. And the calf is also experiencing that high temperature um, at that stage. So we will see decreased birth weight in the calf, decreased immunoglobulin um, absorption, and decreased milk at first lactation. So animals were heat stressed during the last 60 days of lactation in the Florida uh, summer, so they were very heat stressed. Um, and the heat stressed animals were only provided the shade of a barn, and the cooled animals were provided sprinklers and fans, so very nice. And then I adopted them onto my study at about 18 to 20 months of age as well. So we hypothesized that in utero hyperthermia or heat stress would again impact heifer growth, feed efficiency, and methane emissions. And I did not see a difference in dry matter intake between the heat or the cooled animals. Um, and I also did not see a difference in residual feed intake, which is an important measurement of feed efficiency. But I wanted to show you this graph because I think it's important to show you how we calculate residual feed intake. So we, we um, model dry matter intake. We predict dry matter intake uh, using metabolic body weight and average daily gain in the computer. And that's the line that you see going through. And then we compare that to what we actually observed the animal eating every day. So the efficient animals are below the line because we, they're eating less than what we would expect. And the animals that are less efficient are the animals that are above the line because they're eating more than what we'd expect based on their needs. So again, I didn't see a difference in the treatments, but I thought this graph was important to show you all. And then this, uh, these are the methane emission results that I found for this study as well. Um, again, didn't see a treatment, or treatment effect or treatment by day um, interaction, but I thought it was cool to kind of see how methane emissions change like over uh, the whole period that we measured them. And then just a couple of conclusions. So pair house calves or heifers um, ate more depending on the week throughout the study. Um, despite a similar average daily gain, and we, again, we think it's because of the increased body weight that the pair house animals came on to the study with. And heifers that were individually or pair houses calves didn't differ in feed efficiency or, again, average daily gain. But we still encourage pair or group housing because of those um, early life benefits and um, we could see a few of them in the visit data as well. Um, and then for the heat stress study, a couple conclusions. The heifers that were in utero heat stress, I didn't see any differences in them. However, this is not like a free ticket to go and heat stress your uh, dry cows, <laughs> right? Like there's still a lot of um, very negative consequences that come from heat stressing your cows. So 
that's so important to do. And that's all I have, so thank you. All right, so uh, I just want to take a second to note that it's easy to think about the research outcomes from the university. That's something we do. We have research results that get published, but one of the other outcomes of what all of us do when we're mentoring students and doing research is that we're producing these trained students. We're helping them reach their career goals, and they're going on into many different facets of the dairy community, the dairy industry, around the state and around the country. So students like Kaylee always make us very proud, and I think with students like that in the pipeline, we're all in good hands, right? So thank you again, Kaylee, for tackling a talk uh, here today and sharing what you've been working on. All right, so the last speaker in this block and in our, our two pairs of blocks here are, is Kate Kritzinger, who is an assistant professor in animal and dairy science, or sorry, animal and food science here at UW River Falls. And uh, she is yet another of our hub funded faculty members. Her research interests involve the improvement of dairy cattle quality of life using various agricultural systems. And she'll share with us some research in that area. Thanks and welcome, Kate. Alrighty, thank you, Heather, for the introduction. Another short person, and I realize that I am the last person standing between all of you and lunch, so I will try not to go over. Um, the project that we are working on is titled Characterizing the Behavior and Management of Dairy Cows and Neonatal Calves Shortly After Birth. It's a very long title, which I generally dislike, but I figured it was better to be thorough so that we know what is going on. Um, and I'm sort of gonna start at the start here. We've talked about milk, we've talked about different applications of waste products, social capital, and now we're getting to talk about the cows, which is really where it all begins. Um, approximately once per year, and hopefully our cows stay on a, a once a year cycle, we um, have a cow deliver a calf. And the reason that we do that is to initiate lactation so that we can make milk and things. Um, but when we talk about the transition period, which is the three weeks prior to calving to the three weeks after calving, we see a whole host of problems. So we spend that three weeks leading up trying to prepare the cow and get her metabolically ready to stay healthy. And then we spend the next three weeks after calving trying to support that cow and keep her healthy. Um, but one of the issues that we see is about 70% of all disease that we see in mature animals on dairies happens in that first three weeks after calving, and it affects approximately 30 animals, which is quite a bit when we consider that um, transition cow diseases reduce milk production, they can increase um, rates of culling within the first 60 days or even longer if they don't hit that mark of where they should be producing milk. Um, and also if a cow is sick, she probably doesn't feel well, which is why we're worried about it from a welfare perspective. Um, and then I wanna talk about social license for a moment. So. As a dairy industry, we see that consumers are becoming more and more aware and more and more interested in agricultural practices, and the dairy industry is not exempt from that. Um, so when we talk about social license to produce, what we're really talking about is the dairy industry maintaining its ability to regulate our own practices without outside interference, thinking about things like Prop 2 or new legislation. And part of that comes along with making sure we are producing um, dairy products responsibly in a way that the public would consider appropriate. And so part of what I talked about, this whole idea of a cow delivering a calf once per year to initiate lactation, there's another step that goes along with that, which is that the calf is removed from the cow almost immediately, within a few hours of birth generally. This practice was implemented to protect calf health um, as well as protect cow health. And then, of course, after that, we want to harvest the milk. And so while it was born out of the intention of keeping animals healthy, the public has really caught on to this and do not see it as favorable. In studies um, and in the media, we see that the public or consumers really value naturalness on dairy um, dairy farms. So that includes things like social housing, which was talked about in the last presentation, and not individually housing calves, giving access to pasture, and then, of course, keeping cows with calves. Um, this is an, uh, an ad campaign that was done in 
the UK. You can see it's from England and Wales down in the corner here. Um, but of course, this is to elicit an emotional response to get the public interested in this practice. And while it may seem a little bit far-fetched, like this is only happening in Europe and people aren't going to care in the United States, what we see is that this is actually hitting closer to home um, and currently uh, more so than we might expect. So this um, was from August, I think, um, of this year. And actually there was a lawsuit that was brought against Organic Valley that said removing calves from the cow, from their mother, is an inhumane practice. Um, it really hasn't had much legs, but I think it's important that we do keep this in mind as we go forward. Um, if we look at other industries, and as an example, thinking about um, pigs, so housing sows and gestation crates, or even hens and battery cages, what we've seen is this sort of public-led movement um, with pressure from purchasers um, and legislation where those practices have gone away and or have been substantially reduced and not at the hands of the industry. The decisions of how they manage their animals was essentially taken out of their hands. And so as an industry, we really need to be proactive in considering what the public is talking about and really maintaining the ability to make um, data-informed decisions that the industry is a stakeholder in. And we want to make sure that producers are also the ones making these decisions because they know their farms best, right? So um, this is sort of a focus, and I, I think that we need to really keep this in mind moving forward. So to look at both of these things, both animal health as well as cow-calf contact, we have two main objectives of this project. And the first one is to look at the behavior of cow-calf pairs together, um, cows and calves in a semi-natural setting. Um, and then the second objective is to look at the housing and management practices of transition cows on dairy farms in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, and so the first objective, I think I've, I've covered pretty thoroughly as to why this is important. But the second objective, we've seen a substantial increase in our understanding of nutrition and disease pathways in transition cows, but yet those disease rates remain very high. And so I think there's more exploration that's needed to say, okay, what's going on and, and how can we address it? Because we really don't know too much about how animals are being handled in that critical period um, after calving. And so our first project is looking at the behavior of cow-calf pairs, as well as dairy cows and calves in what I'm calling a semi-natural setting, so on pasture, and we'll be watching them for the first two weeks after calving. We found a farm um, in Shitek where they uh, pasture raise their animals. So they actually have a pretty interesting system where they have one herd of lactating cows and then they have a herd of foster cows. So they don't bucket, bucket or bottle feed any of their calves. All of the calves are moved on to foster cows and then they're housed separately from the lactating cows. So we'll be watching 20 cow-calf pairs um, from the time of calving until two weeks later. And the reason that we chose this period is because we know from dairy production, or no, beef production and some previously published literature that this is sort of a critical period where cows will move away from the herd to give birth. They like to find an area that's isolated from other cows, um, but that also has some natural cover like overhead trees and grasses. Um, to, deliver, to deliver their calf, and then they'll slowly re-enter the herd over a few days while the calf is, stays in that crush period where they mostly hide and the cow returns to it. And then within about a week to two weeks, we see that the cow and the calf both fully rejoin the herd. And so we want to see if this behavior is maintained um, in dairy animals. And the way that we are watching behavior is we are using continuous video recordings. Um, this is a photo of Shauna Siegel, a graduate student who is working on this project. And so what we'll be doing is setting up cameras, um, actually mounted to basketball hoops, and then they'll be powered by this solar panel. Um, so you can see her testing out the solar panel, making sure that it works over on the right side. And then the photo on the left is, is the form that we're using, and we will be lining the exterior with cameras so that we can see these behaviors over time. And then what we can do with these behaviors is we can use them to ask applied research questions. So how are we managing cows on dairies and 
how would we manage them in an effective way that would keep everyone healthy if if it came to that point where we needed that information. And then there's a secondary objective, which is understanding um, how we house and manage cows during that first three weeks after calving. We'll be sending out surveys to farmers in Minnesota as well as Wisconsin to look at this sort of general Midwest region. And we'll be asking questions about how do you house your cows? You know, are you using um, dry pens, close-up pens? calving pens or the individual or group and then how quickly are cows moved out when is the calf separated all of those things that we don't have a lot of data about but will be really great foundational research as we continue to ask more questions about the transition period and try to optimize our animals um, so a project timeline, Heather, <laughs> as Heather said research takes a long time and we were just awarded this funding this year um, so for our first behavior study, we are chugging right along. So we have our farmer who has been wonderful and very gracious in letting us use our cows and willing to work with us. So we very much appreciate them. Um, we've piloted our cameras and our solar panels. So we know that those are functional, which is awesome for behavior research. That's sort of your biggest worry is losing that precious video data. Um, this farm runs a partially seasonal calving, so they calve mostly from April to September, and then there's probably a few stragglers in October. So we will be setting up cameras and recording video from April to September and collecting all of that data this summer. And then after that, Shauna will be so lucky to watch a lot of cow TV, which if anyone's done <laughs> behavior research, you better really love watching cow TV. Um, and then the second study is this, the survey that'll be going out. So we'll actually be mailing that survey out in January and then getting those results back in um, April and start analyzing that in May. So we're chugging right along and hopefully by this time next year, we'll have some interesting research to present at this meeting. And of course, research doesn't happen in a vacuum. So there are a lot of people and organizations that I have to thank for all of their help. The first is the Welfare Lab here. Um, so students and faculty who we have been wonderful to work with and really great support. Um, Jennifer Van Oss from UW-Madison has been a great collaborator on this project. So she is the other, um, P the co-PI for this project. And then Organic Valley, who is the um, co-op of the dairy producer that we're using. So they have been a great support as well as the survey research center who regularly sends me emails asking me for updated copies of the survey so they are great to work with um, and then of course our farm and the dairy innovation hub for supporting these projects and now lunch great thank you for that if i could have all the speakers come up we'll take a few minutes of questions here before we uh, have lunch any questions either in the room or in the uh, virtual group? Everybody wants to eat lunch. No. No one has questions, you just want to eat lunch. I'd say for anybody who can make it out to the farm while we're getting a microphone to the back of the room here, if you make it out to the farm, Kate has a really interesting project with fire hoses too. So make sure to check that out. Oh. We can repeat the question for sure. Yeah, go ahead. Repeat the question. Sure. So the question was if I'm going to look at these heifers through their lactation and see if I continue to see a difference because of that initial treatment. So the answer is I do have lactation data on my the heifers from my first trial. Um, so the ones that were either pair housed or individually housed as calves. And I am planning on looking at a difference if there is a difference um, in lactation. I haven't done that yet. Um, and then my peers 
are looking at the animals that were in utero heat stress or cooled. So I probably won't take their thunder from them, um, but it will be really interesting to see. And they're also following up with the so the next generation that was born to the animals that were in utero heat stress, right? Because it's the cow that's being heat stressed, the animal inside the uterus, but then also there's eggs and follicles, right, inside of the calf that's inside of the, utero, the uterus. So there's a um, transgenerational heat stress effect there possibly. So they will come out with that paper, I'm sure. Question to Dr. Rankin. Uh, lactate, I'll pick on a product, milk lactate. Um, do you know how much lactose has to be removed and how much remaining lactose has to be turned into glucose and galactose to receive the same sweetness you get in natural milk? Have you done that yet? Uh, so if you have just uh, native milk, um, versus um, like lactose-free milk, you'll notice it's quite sweet, rel relatively very sweet. You're, you're, you asked kind of a subtle question, a little different question than that though, and so, so do we know how much glucose galactose we need to add back to make it as sweet as um, na the native milk, I think is the question. Um, no, we haven't really done that. Uh, however, lactose versus glucose galactose syrup um, it's, so, it's almost more of a mathematical calculation in terms of we know the relative sweetness of those sugars against lactose and we can calculate approximately how much sugar we will need, would need to add back just to native milk to give it the same sort of sweet character of, of native milk. And part of that answer would be, you know, at the end of the day, if we bring it to the same sweetness, it'll have less sugar than native milk, which is maybe a flip side to that to that question so yeah so instead of five percent lactose or sh total carbohydrate you know I'm throw a number out maybe it's four percent something like that because it's because lactose is not very sweet relative to glucose and galactose so we won't need to add much back to get um, the sweetness uh, footprint there so. great any other questions Bethany Uh, this question is for Dr. Kreutzinger. Um, regarding the cow-calf behavior data, you're obviously talking about a, a farm infrastructure that's much different than a conventional, you know, grazing, organic, fostering system. Uh, and you mentioned the objective being developing these behavioral assessments for a time in the future where perhaps cow-calf pairing is a necessity. How does the translation of behavior in a grazing system like this translate to a conventional dairy farm that's currently a lot different? So, I mean, the short answer is with another 10 to 15 to 20 years of research. Um, I don't expect anyone in this room or any dairy farm in Wisconsin to implement um, large-scale cow-calf contact into existing infrastructure. So. One of the things that we can do with understanding natural or preferred behaviors with dairy cows is figure out, okay, what's important here and then how does that move into a conventional system? And so it's as simple as things like looking at the fact that cows like to lay down for 12 hours a day. And so we try to, we, we try to accommodate those behaviors. Um, so in addition to just doing the behavioral research, part of that will be working with, you know, um, planning design and ag engineers who really work on designing facilities, um, you know, if those, if those housing processes are to change, but really it's about um, being proactive and having the ability to support dairy farms if, if needed, if those changes are really pushed to occur, and also sort of show the public that like, hey, we heard your concern, so we're talking about it. But yeah, this is a very long-term um, problem and these are just kind of the baby steps. Thank you. Great. All right. If there are no other pressing questions, I'll actually hand it back to Steve. We're slightly past our lunch time, but only by a few minutes. So we'll let Steve instruct us uh, on the next the next parts. <laughs>